You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. We have learned in this course that the U.S. federal government supports both corporate and business needs for inexpensive workers and high profits. Since its inception, the United States has maintained groups of rightless workers. In this course has viewed the historical experience of the different directions of humanity, red, white, black, yellow, and brown. We have studied the experience of the immigrant as slaves, uh, colonial subjects, racial and ethnic minorities, and undocumented workers. And the resounding theme throughout the study is that the federal government ensures people without rights for business. The United States practices exclusionary citizenship. It began with indentured servants, then it moved to slavery. It is now called undocumented immigration, which is a contracted form of labor. We have witnessed disenfranchisement and dispossession of the immigrant worker sprinkled with white racism. Now the fear of the other, the fear of the immigrant translates into policy that prevents people from achieving social justice and equality. Whites and Europeans were extended open immigration. They came as voluntary immigrants. Meanwhile, restricted immigration was created for everyone else. Africans endured enslavement. Asians experienced exclusion. Native people and Mexicans have to and have had to deal with conquest. Aristide Zolberg writes that the United States immigration and naturalization law is about creating a nation by design. So to help us understand how we are a nation by design, we are blessed to have as our guest today, today's program, Dr. Vivian Price. Well, let me just share with you about Professor Price. She's just amazing. Uh, she's a filmmaker, an educator, an activist. And after earning her MA in history at the University of Texas, Austin, she worked in factories. Uh, she worked in a refinery, and she was a construction electrician And before returning to school to get her PhD. Uh, she is presently, uh, she has a doctorate in politics and society from UC Irvine, and she is presently associate professor in interdisciplinary studies at California State University of Dominguez Hills. She is a coordinator of labor studies, and she is presently the secretary treasurer of our local chapter of the California Faculty Association, and is a delegate to the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. Now, what is so amazing is uh, she is involved in many projects, and her latest project includes the Tradeswomen, um, <clears throat> Tradeswomen's Archive Project, which is a new media piece. Uh, the Tradeswomen Address the Next Generation. Her film, she has, uh, uh, I think, three films, right? That you have, uh, is Hammering It Out, and, uh, Transnational Tradeswomen. Uh, both are distributed by Women Make Movies. And she is proud to be a co director of Harvest of Loneliness. Dr. Price, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, coming and blessing us with your expertise. So we are honored. But let's start out by uh, sharing with us how you became involved in history and how you became involved in labor uh, studies. Well, I too am an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, and what your introductory remarks are something that's uh, very important to me too. Uh, the immigrant, immigration policy of the United States affected my family mm -hmm. as well. In fact, my grandparents were killed because the quota for people who were born in Hungary um, was uh, filled when my grandfather was trying to escape Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a lot of um, information, you know, that, that we have to understand in terms of seeing the movements, the shifts, um, and, uh, and kinds of exclusionary policies that we, we've, um, you know, encountered, we've, that we've experienced. So being an immigrant and being somebody who also had a, a feeling from my childhood of um, wanting to understand why there was so much injustice in the world mm -hmm. um, from my own family's experience, I, um, I, I was raised in a Jewish household where really it was more about never again for the Jews, mm -hmm. um, but compassion for other people. But I thought it was really important to understand, you know, more about various cultures and moving to Los Angeles in a very multicultural um, society from New York, which was also very multicultural. Um, I've had the opportunity to really work with a lot of different people, whether it was in factories or in the university. And I met um, Gilbert Gonzalez, who was a professor of Chicano studies and, and still is at UC Irvine and was working on the um, research and, and 
uh, became a book, Guest Workers or Colonized Labor, about the Bracero program. And um, I had done a number of films, which you mentioned, about gender and labor. And this is actually also a book about gender and labor, um, also about you know immigration policy. And I was so struck by how um, powerful his book was in terms of understanding uh, the Latino experience, the Mexican American experience in the United States, that I thought this would make a great film. Yes. And Gil agreed, and so we started our venture. Oh, fantastic! Um, inform us. Uh, you, you, there's a here in the, in, in the university. There's interdisciplinary studies and pace. Could you share with us what interdisciplinary studies is and pace, and how Certainly. it has benefited students? Right. Great. Thank you. Um, interdisciplinary studies is we call it IDS for short. And it's a program for returning adults to finish or complete their uh, studies and get their bachelor's degree and you know, transfer to uh, Dominguez Hills. All of our classes are online um, or in the evening or on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, right, you have a class right after this. Right, right, I do. So thanks for fitting it into, yes, you know. No, thank you for fitting <laughs> us into your schedule. Uh, and and we have wonderful students. A lot of our students are, you know, across the board in terms of age, ranging from, you know, sort of the traditional college age of in, in their 20s through their 70s. Through their 70s, yeah. Amazing. And so we have very interesting um, populations in our in our program. Mm -hmm. And then we Pace is a program pr program for adult college um, education. So that's that's what Pace means. Right. Programs for adult college education. Right, yeah. right. And uh, sometimes people say program for accelerated college education. Okay. But it came out of Wayne State back in the 1970s okay. when people thought really we need a progressive program that honors the experiences of adult learners right. and, uh, and, and has a progressive political agenda that, that opens people's eyes to multiculturalism, to economic oppression. And, um, and that's really wh where PACE and IDS come from. Labor Studies also was founded on, on this campus. Right. We have the only four-year um, uh, bachelor's degree in Southern California. Well, that you're the grants. coordinator for Labor Studies, so share with yeah. us the, the importance of Labor Studies. Right, I, I, I jumped the gun here. No, that's quite all right, <laughs> that's all right. Because uh, there you, you are coordinating many different uh, uh, programs through Labor Studies, right? Right. Share so, with us. What yeah, I, I'm, I work in interdisciplinary studies and in labor studies. So our labor studies program is a four-year uh, program, and we take transfer students to. Um, a lot of our students are also cross-enrolled. They are part of a community college. And this is something that your listeners may not know. Mm -hmm. um, if you're taking six units at a community college, um, in the same semester, you can take three units here. We can take one class at Dominguez Hills with instructor permission for only ten dollars. Amazing. So say that again. Yes, yes, I will. I, mean I will. Ten dollars. Right, right. So um, we call it cross enrollment. And if so, if you're enrolled right. in a class in right. a community college, right? So let me let me back up and say if you're if you're already a Dominguez Hill student, this does not apply to you. Okay. But if you have cousins or brothers and sisters or or you know people who are going to community college. Let them know about it, or if you're if you are a community college student and have not um, applied to Dominguez yet, if you're taking any classes, six units of any any subject matter, at, in the same semester you can apply. There's a cross enrollment form, and you can email me about it. If you, you know, or mm -hmm. if you well, there is a web you. there is a website for uh, labor studies, right? Right. Uh, do we have? Can you put up the website for labor studies? It's uh, DH. Well, I D yeah. There. Uh, okay. Now that's that. That'll that'll work. IDS. Um, IDS. That'll that's take the IDS. You to, okay. There's the labor studies. Okay, and then there, dhlaborstudies.org is our also our our mm -hmm. gets you to both programs too. Okay. At any rate, um, yeah. So if you email one of us or go to our our um, web page and contact us, we'll let you know a little bit more detail about how to do that yeah, across the moment, because it's I really a wonderful that. thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we, of course, the other thing about labor studies, we have wonderful faculty that teach um, you know, workers' rights and contracts and negotiation and labor law and a number of other related subjects in Chicano studies, Africana mm -hmm. studies, sociology. 
Um, and then we have our fifth annual Labor, Social, and Environmental Justice That's Fair right. coming up. And you've, you've been doing, well, it's fifth annual, so the last five years you've provided a great service to the university. Um, last year's, of course, was the fourth annual. Uh, this is going to be the fifth. Uh, well, we have somebody uh, uh, that's calling in right now, All right. but we'll talk about how the fairs came about. Uh, who do we have on? The uh, it's uh, Livmar calling from Corona. Thank you, Livmar, for for participating. You have. A Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Pretty uh, good. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question uh, in, that I noticed when I was watching the Becerra documentary, where it looked like the Mexican government didn't support its people either through the Los Mineros program or also through the Basero program. Has that changed now, or does it continue to be the same where where the politics in Mexico is still kind of catered to the American businesses? Well, thank you, Livmar, for asking that question. Um, I think what I'd like to do is if, if we can postpone answering that question until we get to the documentary. Uh, right now we're discussing uh, uh, about social environmental justice fair. And then we will come back to, to your question, if that would be okay for you. That would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I would, and hold on. Stay online. We'll, we're going to get to you. All right. Very important question. It's a very Thank important you. question. But let us take care of, of, of this, and then we're going to get into uh, specific segments of uh, the documentary so we can discuss the issues that you raised. Great. Thank you. So let's, let's talk about um, this year's fair. Well, tell us how the fairs came about. Okay. Um, I was lucky that one of our students in the Labor Studies program uh, was very active on campus, and he was involved in student government. Um, his name is Scott Hill. Scott Hill, yes, I had him for a class for my Mexican I, Identities great class. Student. So he, he said to me, you know, Dr. Price, not that many people know about Labor Studies, and it's a great program. We should do something. How about an event on campus, like a, a labor fair, where we bring trade unions to come to the, the campus. and our students can learn more about labor. And I thought that was a terrific idea and that we should also expand it to thinking about other ways of looking at social justice and community organizations. And then as things grew, we sort of got involved in Earth Day and environmental justice. And we really see that these things all go together, yes. uh, community, the environment, and labor. And what's wonderful about the fair is that it's student organized. I have a class, mm -hmm. and this is a class which is um, every year uh, available to students, the Labor Studies Practicum, where students learn about organizing, they read about organizing, Fantastic. they read about leadership, and then they also um, reach out to the organizations, to artists, to musicians. Uh, we're doing theater of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a cultural as well as informational event Students also um, get some resources like internships and jobs mm -hmm. through the fair. Now, if, um, if, let's take a look at last year's poster. I don't know if we can get the, uh, the image up. And then, if, uh, crew, if you could put down uh, on, on the bottom thirds the fifth annual labor, social, and there we go. Now, uh, here, and in, 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 now I didn't see, I don't know if you have one for this year. That we have, we're working on you're that. You're working on it right now, but it says here, you know, join us volunteer, get a booth. Right. You network with 50 plus social justice organizations. Uh, which, which organizations right. are you? Are, are you right, so in, in labor, we always have uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers mm -hmm. come. Uh, sometimes the International Workers of the World come. IWW, yeah, how about that? Yeah, um, the uh, Southern California District of the ILWU, the Longshore, the often come. Was, yes. uh, We have the electricians and my union, California Faculty Association. Yes. And then, you know, there's, I don't want to leave anybody out. Right. California State Employees Association. There's many different many unions. Different organizations. So it really spans um, SEIU, which spans also county workers and city workers. Many different organizations come. Uh, then community groups, we have groups from the, uh, the East Yard, Wilmington, that are dealing with environmental issues mm -hmm. as well as um, issues of uh, the children, the youth in the area. Uh, Watts Community Strategy Center comes, um, the Youth Justice Coalition. And then we have artists and artists, musicians. Yes, with, artists, yes, yeah. artists. Uh, you, you have any guest speakers? This we're working on a number of uh -huh. guest speakers. They're still to be announced. Okay, that's fine. And, and yes, and yeah, our, with these yeah. interactive workshops, sure. That right, and again, this is, we're just really solidifying the program. And okay. Because it is a class, and I don't, 
you know, I like to um, get my students to decide what things are going to happen. Uh -huh. But in the past, for example, we've had people from the Writers Guild come okay. and talk about, you know, labor relations in mm. the studios. We've had uh, a film showcase, and we'll probably do that again, mm. where I was just contacted by Cuéntame, who's, um, they have a new film called Immigrants for Sale, which mm. is about the detention centers and the that. interests that are involved in kind of lobbying against immigration Well, reform. then maybe we can get somebody uh, from Cuéntame to come to this program. That's right, that's and right. Then, you think if I give them two weeks notice that... <laughs> I, bet, I bet I can connect <laughs> you, right, hook you, you up. Yeah. You, we're going to get somebody. Thank you very much. I knew, I knew that you would help out here. Um, yes, um, well, th with, with regards to this, this program here, how will my students benefit? All right, so let me say the date is April 25th. Okay. Um, it's, it'll be uh, basically from 9 to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And if your students come, uh, they actually could volunteer. We have a lot of different ways people can volunteer, and um, maybe they'll get extra credit. Uh, well, the class will be over by then. But, but I guess I can, give them, post, uh, I can give them some credit <laughs> after, after the fact. Just it's, it's possible. Uh, anything is possible. Yes, of course. But aside from that, just the experience, the experience of meeting other students on campus and having an event, you know, that's all day that, that might be, um, you know, some students can't come in the morning, some can't come in, in the evening. So it, it leaves a, a lot of room for people to, you know, fit into the time slots. And if they right. contact us, if, you know, I think dhlaborstudies.org, they can contact me. I think my... Email is on this as yes. well, vprice at csudh.edu. There's campus tours. We bring several hundred high school students. They can mm. work with high school students. That's fantastic. If they're already doing some community work, they might offer a community organization to come. Maybe they're working with a labor union. Maybe they're artists or musicians who want to perform or um, offer their services. Or just help with registration or parking. Mm. There's many ways that people can be part of this, and it's it's a very satisfying event. You get yes. to see people in action, doing things that are fun and interesting this and helping the community. This is always a festive atmosphere. Uh, this is the last three of them that I was uh, able to attend or you know observe, because I'm always working, and then I take my students and take, get a break. Great. But yes, they've been great. You're also uh, uh, the secretary treasury of our local chapter of California Faculty Association. Uh, share with us what's going on. Well, I think that one of the biggest things is that um, our campus, as well as many campuses throughout the country, as well as the CSU system, um, have inequities that are, you know, we are constantly trying to ameliorate, if not transform. And one of the big ones is the situation of lectures. Yes. And since lectures are 60% of the teaching faculty on this campus, uh, that's an, a very important issue for us. And uh, lectures are oftentimes not represented in the Senate, um, so we're we're uh, we're supporting a measure right now so that there's a lecturer's voice in the Senate. Uh, there's a question of getting your contract early and on time, getting paid on time. Oh yeah. Uh, things like this. I mean, all of us who work for a living have working class issues, have workers' issues, and. Mm -hmm. um, and the union is here to defend everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, for tenure track people, I, this is really an um, important question because it, lectures rights are also affecting everybody else, the tenure track. Uh, tenure track folks have to pick up the burden of working on committees or doing the you know, shared governance as you know, more of the uh, work is put on fewer and fewer people. So it's very important for us right. to fight, f you know, in solidarity. Definitely. So there, and there are other issues as well, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, students are facing this question of if you haven't um, graduated and you have more than 150 units, they would like, the administration is trying to float um, the option of paying full tuition, which is something like $15,000. Yes. And that affects faculty as well as students. So we're really trying to investigate that and students are very alarmed about that because there's all kinds of reasons. I mean, if you're just biding your time, that's one thing, but if you're, you know, you've switched majors and now you've discovered labor studies um, and you're, you know, you need to finish out that major, 
why should you have to pay fifteen thousand dollars because you have right. discovered this you know later or rather than earlier in your educational career okay. and then plus not only are you uh, involved with the faculty association but you're also large involved with a larger umbrella organization of uh, the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor share with us something about the importance of that institution or that organization right um, I'm a proud delegate to the uh, uh, Federation of Labor, mm -hmm. which is in LA. We have the fine leadership of Maria Elena Dorazo, who is our, our secretary treasurer right. of that institution. Every month, we come together. Uh, right now, we meet at the Musicians Hall in LA, and it's janitors, it's nurses, it's SAG-AFTRA, it's um, teachers, K through 12, and uh, you know, across the spectrum, we get to meet one another. The activists and the representatives of all these different unions. We find out what our issues are, how we can help each other, firefighters oh, as well. A feeling of solidarity. Right, and then, f so, for example, the letter carriers are talking to yes. us about what's happening to the post office, and uh, they just let us know that, you know, the letter carriers are actually 9% of the GDP of this country, wow. and they're the biggest employer of veterans. Wow. And um, they're, you know, Right now, they're, they're really in the process of being laid off. Yes. I think they want to lay off at least 10% of all the mm. workers in the post office. How is that going to affect the public? Not everybody uses email, and not everything can be delivered. Mm -hmm. And one, one example that they said is, you know, medication, that um, a lot of us get our medication through mail because it's cheaper. That medication will be delayed in, in you know, its receipt. So. We get very well informed by what's going on and, and what's shared there. And there's a lot of uh, there's going to be a lot of activity that's going to be going uh, going on uh, soon, right? Right, it's March 16th. Events. There's going to be a nationwide um, a nationwide protest about the letter carriers. Yes. So. All right. Now, what's fascinating is, of course, you've well, you've you've done you've dedicated yourself to creating a just society. Um, tell us about. Trade Women's Archive Project. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll keep this brief because we've got... Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to the phone. Oh, well, I don't know. What right. to, you decide when you want to leave. And <laughs> I have to teach you another class, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm opening up this what class. Time? Wait, I'm, I want to be there at 1. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Then let's... Well, let's, what, let's I'll just say yeah, one word about the Trade Women Archive. Women archive. Or a few. Uh, having been an electrician, uh, I saw firsthand about, um, you know, what it's like to enter a, a trade and be in an environment where it's sort of um, a father and son, uh, you know, give this trade to the next generation, an inheritance, a working class inheritance. And for people of color, for immigrants, for women to break into that well-paid, skilled yes. area, um, it's difficult. It's def yes. And, um, and there's a lot of strategies people have employed to try to survive. and. Mm -hmm. Um, again, create solidarity, uh, build bridges mm -hmm. within those environments. So um, I've done those two films. One is about uh, women in LA who were part of the tradeswomen movement. Another one was about women in internationally who have been working, building residences and, mm -hmm. and um, all kinds of edifices uh, for thousands of years, for example, in India, and that, you know, that's mm -hmm. very interesting to look at the history where families work together. Um, and my most recent project is that on our university we have a, um, put together an archive of many different people's papers, of some of us who are, have retired from the trades, some of the people that are still in the trades, mm -hmm. and now we have a, a, uh, an archive site. We are using a web portal, which is tradeswomenarchives.com. Okay, I think we have, uh, no, yes, Trade Women's, we have that. We could put up that website, tradewomensarchives.com. But yes, tell um, us about tradeswomenarchives.com. that. Tradeswomenarchives.com. And uh, that's where people can go online and share their images and their stories, mm. their documents. Um, and I've gone to a number of different cities and had some workshops with people, women doing this. Um, you know, recording their stories and, and uh, scanning their photos and writing captions. And so it's an exciting project because it's sort of a, a model of how other marginalized communities can create their own archives, mm -hmm. their own history, because we don't want our histories uh, to be 
uh, you know, to disappear. Right. Whereas the archives of the powerful oftentimes are preserved. Um, many of us many, don't, many of you know, us don't have a place to put our our um, documents and our images that we've collected over the mm -hmm. years. And I'm sure that in this collection, you've co uh, uh, there are immigrant women that have Absolutely. been involved in. Absolutely. Right. In right. And I've interviewed a number of them. <coughs> Fantastic. Well, then let's get to Harvest of Empire. Okay. Tell yeah. us about the film yeah. and your experience uh, um, right. co-directing it. Yeah. So, um, Harvest of Empire is actually the uh, the latest, oh, I'm sorry. right? Harvest of Loneliness. Yes, yes. <laughs> a, quite a few we're harvests. We're so. using the Harvest of Empire book from. Oh, that's good. That, so that was a, uh, and there's a new documentary. Yes, right? there is. Yeah. A so Harvest of Loneliness was um, a really eye-opening experience for me. I, although I had studied somewhat about the Bracero program and read Gill's book, uh, going out in the field, going to Stockton and to uh, some of the, you know, to the Berkeley, the Bay Area, um, as well as to Mexico and to uh, places in Southern California, whether it was Jerome Park in Irvine. Um, we went to an, uh, places where braceros were organizing. Many of them were organizing because w only you know one facet of injustice of this program, this guest worker program, so-called guest worker program, was that in the 40s when they brought people in, they held back 10% of their check, saying, well, you've got to go back home. When you go back, we'll give you your 10% of your wages. And then that money never did get back to the workers. So I, um, ironically, you know, there had been a Supreme Court case and many different cases to try for people to recover that money, which they won. But the money still hasn't been, it's you know, f discovered. The Mexican government has put aside a certain amount of money because in the end, you know, it was a, several Mexican banks that got the money from Wells Fargo transferred um, to these banks. And so the Mexican government um, created a, a, a small amount to disperse to people who could find their pay stubs, their contracts, their micas. Right. But a lot of people have, you know, don't keep their pay stubs from, you know, 60 yes, years ago, right, or whatever. Right. Um, so it's really amazing how many people did. And th what they have done is they've organized in different areas, tried to put their documents together and apply for money. And it was through this, these different organizing um, sectors that we were able to interview people and ask them about their experiences. Well, let's, let's go to a, a film clip from the documentary that highlights the recruitment of Braceros and their arrival to the U.S. Uh, so, can we put up that film, film clip? They were brought in on a train. People would get off of the train, naturally, board a bus. And there was an opening back here where the bus would park and the people would come across. So when they got over here, they were in, in very dire conditions health-wise. Llegamos nosotros Ciudad Juárez, ya nos bajaron, llegamos al puente, nos formaban y estaba solo el salón y allí nos metieron a todos, ahí nos desnudaron, ahí nos afocaron las máquinas para fumigarnos con polvo de avión, con insecticida, a todos sin saber si nos quedábamos ciegos o no, en la cabeza, en la cabeza cantidad de polvo. Hasta me mareé yo, me acuerdo de cada vez que me hicieron esas cosas. Y por estar fuerte, toda la ropa estaba hasta caliente cuando la ponía uno. There, there was about seven of us that were hired out of high school, so I had to then 16, 17. 17. This sounds horrible, but they had to be fumigated. At the border, individuality disappears in a cloud of DDT dust. Yeah, I did that for three days, and, I, and then I said, no, I can't do this anymore because... It was degrading to the people, and then, uh, you know, there were some that had all their clothing and et cetera very neatly stacked, and you had to ruffle through it and spray it, and that was, that was a bad deal. For perhaps the first time in his life, he gets a thorough physical examination, partly for his protection and partly to make sure his American employer will get his money's worth. It was very degrading. You have to remember that th this is a captive group. You know, you're going to do what you do with them, and uh, they have no say so. Había médicos que estos dos dedos nos los metían en los testículos. No crea que con modo, no así. Que había muchas gentes que se desmayaban. ¿eh? En piquete, así, nada más. 
they had blood drawn. They were given an x-ray. They were giving a very cursory examination of the, of the tonsils and the teeth. Teníamos que estar como como si fuéramos caballos para la venta. Porque tuvieron los anitos. Estaba malo regresado para atrás. Yo nunca había pasado por eso. Yo, yo estaba muy asustado, con mucha pena, ¿verdad? Que me daba a mí. Porque a mí nunca me había pasado eso allá. Ni con doctor lo habíamos hecho. Y aquí fue la primera vez que me pasó eso. Y luego se enfrentaban a un sistema burocrático que ni conocía. Por eso en las micas de los braceros, cuando ve uno las fotos, decía, ah, caray, ¿por qué ni siquiera se peinaban para retratarse? Pues estaban hasta asustados, ¿verdad? Le decían, Antonio, pásale para acá. Y se asomaba por la ventana, le ponían un, este, un número y lo retrataban. Y salía asustado, así cansado, hambriento. The first time that I actually visited the reception center, the manager of the, uh, of the center said it would be okay for me to go into the hall where the selecting, as they called it, was going on that day. The uh, fellow representing some growers association up in Northern California was happy enough to have me stand by his side while he demonstrated the way he did his uh, so-called selecting. Well, there were these hundreds of men lined up outside and they would shuffle past this guy who uh, commented on why he was selecting one guy and rejecting another guy. And it all had to do with whether they measured up to his criteria for what he considered to be a good bracero. These had to be men who were apparently timid, docile, unlettered, impoverished. Anybody who was well-dressed or well-spoken would be rejected. El centro de California, el corralón, le decía, ¿no? Allí estaba toda la raza. Una comparación como si allí hubiera eh, encerrado un montón de bueyes, por decirlo así, discúlpenme la palabra. Porque allí llegaban eh, rancheros, ¿no?, de compañías de particulares, que yo quiero 18 gente, que yo quiero 20. Y pasaban de allá al corralón. A ver. I found it unspeakably appalling. I thought that it must be something like this in the slave markets of Charleston or New Orleans or Baltimore or wherever they were selecting in those days. And dice a uno nos humillaban muy feo. Nos veían casi como a los negros cuando este los All right, that's a fascinating experience, but we have phone calls and we've got students uh, asking questions. So let's take the phone calls. This is uh, Lazira calling from from Los Angeles. Thank you, Lazira. Hi, um, Ms. Price, thank you for um, dedicating your time to us and sharing your experiences. I noticed that um, you, you, you seem to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, and I wanted to know if that was strategic on your part as far as integrating into the labor force to understand the different aspects or the different um, trials that each of um, each person that would be um, employed in these different departments or um, um, labor would experience if it, if, if it was strategic because you went from electrician to an educator and you seem to be all over the place. But I, I want to know if it was strategic. And then my second question in reference to the Beceros. Um, I did have an opportunity to view that um, documentary and after I saw it, um, everything became more clear to me as far as what was going on with them. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think Wells Fargo had a hand in having these people's money. And when I learned that, I went straight to the bank, closed the account, and I told them, whenever you give the money back where it's due, I'll come back. And I even encouraged my family members to close their accounts 
from Wells Fargo because they had a hand in that um, in those monies that are owed to them, the ten percent. So those, you know, those are my two questions. Great questions. Uh, well, first of all. I wish it had been strategic. <laughs> <laughs> it was more about survival and, yes. and also choices. You know, I, um, let's put it this way. Back when I got my master's in history, it was a recession. And I did want to teach. And it was really hard to find a job. Okay. So, but I was also a political activist. And that's when I decided to start working in factories. Oh. And then I really had to learn how to be a factory worker because I was used to having freedom of speech. And when you work in a factory, oftentimes you don't. Oh. Um, so when I would speak up about safety conditions or conditions on the line, mm -hmm. I would get fired. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to learn a lot about survival. Uh, but at any rate, I, I think looking back, I'm... I'm proud of having so much experience and being able to draw from those experiences. I feel very fortunate to um, have a compassion and being able to empathize with people in many different wor walks of life because of my own experiences. Mm -hmm. Regarding Wells Fargo, if you there is a Supreme Court case, and, and perhaps right. we could make that available to, mm -hmm. to students, the um, opinion on that case. Presumably, uh, Wells Fargo returned the money. <laughs> they, they did return the money, not to the people, but they transferred it to two banks in Mexico. Okay. And I think, I, I, I don't want to state the names of those banks because uh -huh. I'm offhand, I don't, you know, don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that they're the correct one right. names. But uh, again, we can get that information mm -hmm. to you. There were so many people involved. Um, I, I think I really appreciate your sense of feeling that uh, somebody should be held accountable exactly. for this transgression of people not getting their money. Right. Um, and, and really, this leads us to the next question of what about the Mexican government and mm -hmm. their. Uh, Leave Mars question. Yeah. Yes. Because, you know, banks are usually regulated by governments, and mm -hmm. you, you would think that the Mexican you know, government would have uh, compelled the banks to make those uh, transfers to the, their rightful owners, mm -hmm. the braceros. And I think that it's because of that that they've taken on some of the responsibility now. Um, in the film, we show that uh, what we learned was that really the Mexican consulate was brought in to help recruit workers in Mexico to um, uh, help uh, categorize workers in terms of whether they were from different parts of uh, Mexico right. and were better, you know, skilled at picking lemons or oranges. Or Calavita, just uh, uh, the, the book, that the textbook that the students are reading that we're using for the course traces the at right. least at least that uh, that kind of experience. Right, and then we we interviewed one of the uh, uh, leaders of a of a migrant camp. Um, a migration center um, mm -hmm. in Huaymas, who also talks about this in in the film. Um, at any rate, uh, maybe he maybe that hit the cutting room floor. I don't know, but he he was the the fellow that spoke about working in um, Huaymas also told us this that they really had, you know, a, that the Mexican government was very much involved in really helping create the conditions to allow people to help the growers in the United right. States. Right. And um, so in a way, it was sort of taxpayers' money from Mexico that helped fund, fund the yes. Bracero program. And then also Calavita brings up in, in her book uh, the notion that the Mexican government insisted on, not, uh, on having the labor come from central Mexico, not along the border, because in that way they would, they would gain... Right they would gain also some uh, monetary uh, benefits from that. Right, yeah. and, and even as far south as the Yucatan, people mm -hmm. came. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, too, is what people, people think, um, well, they, they wanted to work, right? So uh, what's wrong with that? Well, um, what we also try to show is that people had to fund their own journey. 
And mm -hmm. while the growers were benefiting from this, people had to sell land or sell a cow or mm -hmm. and go into debt. They had to, mm -hmm. um, you know, put forward a mordida, a, a bribe, right. to try to get on the list or get a good place on the list. And this was this was coming out of the family's um, hide, right. and 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 really got them into debt too. So the Mexican government was very much involved in the recruitment from different parts of Mexico in, in set, you know distributing flyers and creating the list mm -hmm. and setting up the migration centers, but it didn't fund any or or even uh, um, develop any places for people to stay overnight to eat, you know, the people would be at the migration centers uh, for sometimes weeks or months, starving. Right. And um, there, was, there were no barracks, there was nothing there for people. So, uh, you know, this is kind of outrageous. And then when the people came to the United States, it was, unions were not allowed, right? The people were not represented as workers. And they were under contract that looked good on paper, but actually, uh, they were not guaranteed yes. any kind of wage. They really mm -hmm. were, it was really up to, nobody was doing oversight, and we heard that from some of the inspectors that said, you know, it, this was something that, again, looked good on paper, but if you don't regulate it, if you don't inspect and see, well, what kind of food are people getting that they're charged for while they're not working in the fields? You know, if maybe it's raining and they can't work. They're still having to pay for their wage, for their food, for, food. for the blanket for insurance, right. and uh, and if the the only representative who could speak on behalf of the workers was the Mexican consul, mm -hmm. and it, a, another thing that we try to show in the film is what they would say is, you know, be quiet, don't say anything, you know, represent us well mm -hmm. so that right. we can get send more people here, and you know, if this be lucky, be happy, you have a job, and really this the is very good, not, yes. and so it. <coughs> And, and it's not that these were bad people, but people were put into these different positions and really compelled to, to take these kinds of positions. Mm -hmm. And plus the... the I mean, th 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 these kinds of, say these kinds of things to people. And, and the attitude amongst growers as well as state representatives was they were not, they did not treat Mexicans as humans or they, they had this approach that they were non-human. That's why the term wetback, wetback, they called them wets or whatever, is these, these uh, epithets that uh, just are throughout the 1950s during this. Absolutely, yeah. and, and that, was the the nice, that was the nice word for people, nice word. right? <laughs> yeah. and, and again, Oops. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people say, well, there were some nice growers, there were, and you know, there were nice slave owners too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that it was the individual people that were good or bad, um, or prejudiced or not, but the whole system really was created Encouraged. in order to exploit people. Right. to create a vulnerable workforce that people could take, growers could take advantage of so and build the economy and not to defend the rights of the workers. And then just institutionalize the prejudice. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more phone calls. Well, thank you, Lazira, for asking those questions. Amanda for calling from Santa Barbara. Oh, Santa Barbara, thank you, Amanda. Hi, Professor. Um, thank you, Dr. Price, for a very moving uh, documentary. Um, I've seen this documentary before when I took a class, Sociology of Work, here at Dominguez Hills as well. And um, I come twice. originally from the San Joaquin Valley, where my family, um, some of my family did work in the fields mm. up there. And I was um, particularly interested in um, the fumigation process that they made the, uh, the Sarah's go through. And I was curious if you found any um, health factors or health risks that some of the uh, form of aceros had um, have because of going through that process, and if they even sought any kind of legal recourse um, because of that, um, you know. Excellent question, and I, I can't tell you too much. Um, it's been well documented, you know, that this uh, that DDT was used mm -hmm. to supposedly de-louse people. And uh, this is not the first time or the last time that mm -hmm. DDT was used. I think... They started in the 1920s. Right. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. there was a 
a, a really interesting story of a woman who refused to ha be fumigated that way. And, um, you know, she was arrested, and, but she started a protest, and, uh, which was somewhat um, successful at that time. Uh, but it still was a practice that came back into being. And, um, you know, DDT has also been used, when it was outlawed in the United States, it was shipped to countries in the Global South to use on their fields as well. So uh, unfortunately, we have a long history in the United States of manufacturing deadly chemicals and then having people um, you know, control them and then exporting them. In this case, they were used on, on vulnerable workforce coming into the United States. While we interviewed people about the experience, we never really found out about the repercussions on their health. Uh, that's a, that would be a very important study, and I, I, it's possible that someone has done that. Uh, I, I really can't answer any more than that. Yeah. Thank you, Monda. And do you have any Thank additional you. comments? Do you have any? Okay, Karen. Karen calling from Long Beach. Thank you, Karen. Oh, yes. Hello, Professor Frog. How are you doing, again. Karen? Good. I actually had um, the same process as the last caller, Mom. Um, so I guess I've got two points or two questions. Um, say, for example, after going through the, the uh, selling land and, and paying the bribes to be uh, accepted as a bracero, actually, let me turn down my sound on one thing, and then maybe I could hear this better. Sorry. Um, is, is there any correlation, say, between the Braceros once they went through that awful humiliating process and the selection that perhaps word got back to their friends and family, et cetera, and the reason why some people may have um, immigrated in illegally is because they did not either have land to sell, have money to pay the bribes, or because they did not want to go through that same process as legal Braceros. That's you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, no, no, that's, yeah. you're, right. you're right on target. Right. You're, you're you're hitting it. Um, this is this is one of the I mean, experiences that many had. I think also it's mentioned in um, the textbook that you're reading of what happened to certain peoples. Why the Operation Wetback uh, was put in motion was to get the growers to stop using uh, undocumented because they needed the workers in whatever way the workers could come in. Yeah, yeah and and it's true. People. While, I mean, first of all, the border is this arbitrary um, space, right? Uh, as a lot of people like to say, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gil likes to tell the story that um, when his family crossed, it was an open border mm -hmm. in the teens and 20s. Mm -hmm. People crossed, went back and forth. It was not patrolled, you know, the way it, it became. Uh, so this is a long history of people coming back and forth. Where there's work, they would cross the border. When it becomes militarized and policed, then it interferes with people's ability to go back and forth. And then it becomes something uh, criminalized, right, to go across the border. And so it, it, it changes the meaning of what people are doing. And then um, in order you know, for, for folks to come. They either have to try to go through a legal process which controls their ability to find work and to set their own terms for work, like the Bracero program, which was a, a form of contract labor that made people very vulnerable. Um, and in many ways, people who, who cross the border without documents at that time or since then have sometimes been more successful at getting better wages or better mm -hmm. working conditions or better jobs because they weren't under the control of this yeah. mandated, um, you know, growers get to decide everything mm -hmm. and interpret the contract for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think that people, your, you know, your question is, do people come different, you know, a different way because they didn't have land or they, they were desperate? Yes, the answer is, and, and yeah. also, People were rejected. They were rejected, and you, you can see from the selection process, if they looked like they 
weren't, you know, their hands weren't calloused enough, or they looked too intellectual. They looked like troublemakers, like <laughs> labor organizers. Yes. Um, they you would be rejected. That. No. Yeah. And, and so those people would also, you know, be crossing the border. Well, hopefully, Karen, is Karen still on, or do we lose Karen? Oh, no, 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 I'm here, yes. but if I could just ask one more question. Yes, then. Play, so, by all means. So then that brings, that brings to mind, say, if someone was rejected and sent back to Mexico, then perhaps then maybe they just came illegally. But then, uh, then that leads me to my next um, question is, how did the legal berceros feel towards the illegal migrants, um, which perhaps may have shown up to work at the same field? I mean, how... how how did they feel about each other? Or did they did, did a, a legal bracero even know that the person working next to him may have been an illegal migrant? I, I think and there was a scene, and, and you covered a scene, or uh, there was a particular person that was talking about that. Right. Well, I, there are a number of different situations. I mean, uh -huh. you know, the growers would try to get braceros because they could pay them less. So, um, they would try to keep people separate, and this is what I think that you're talking about. There were there were people who maybe were undocumented, or maybe they were documented, and they, I mean they were people that were already living in um, California or one of the 27 states that Bracero worked at, worked in, and they had they had their papers, but they would be hired as foremen or they'd be hired as pushers for the Braceros. So these people might even be related. They might be from the same town. They might, have, they might be cousins. But, you know, once again, they were put in certain positions. And uh, so there, there would be hostility by the braceros towards folks that were pushing them if they treated them badly. But not so much, you know, because they were legal or illegal. It was just about how they were treated. They treated and, uh, you know, and, and everybody wanted to try to make a living, you know, it, but the system was set up in a way where if you were a bracero, you had one position. Some people might be lucky, and like braceros were not supposed to uh, work on equipment. They weren't supposed to run tractors. That was part of the contract. That was supposed to be a job that were, was for domestic workers, many of whom were Mexican-American, mm -hmm. who maybe some of them had been on strike and had been well, you the, know, the merchants of labor from uh, exposed that. Right, um, right. And Ernesto Garlarza that was trying to organize exactly. farm workers, and they found that the Bracero program was used to, to break strikes. Right. Yeah. So, um, in some cases, the Braceros were, were asked to run equipment, and then that would cross the hostility, too. So, this is, I see that one of the questions about um, from our, our viewers. Suzanne? Yeah. Yes. I, and I, since I have to leave in about a minute, I'm just going to answer that. This really, um, Karen's question, merges right into your question. People were set against one another, especially, you know, it's not so much about race in this case, although race certainly played a part, but it was more about if you were a domestic worker or if you were a worker that was in the Bracero program. Uh, people in the United States had tried to form unions. The 30s was a time yes, when people were trying to organize, and the beginning of the 40s. The Bracero program was introduced as a strike-breaking right. um, program. And so the domestic workers were not supposed to have to compete. In fact, the Department of Labor made the claim that any domestic worker who wanted a job would still be able to be hired first. Mm -hmm. Again, this is something we tried to cover in the film. But this wasn't necessarily the case. There wasn't the supervision, the oversight, the inspectors, and there's still not the inspectors in the field to regulate the conditions so that farm workers are treated right. like human beings with dignity. So the Bracero program hurt workers across the board. It may have benefited the growers, it may have benefited some individuals in some small way, but in many ways it degraded the conditions of farm workers. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and it created more of a pathway for undocumented workers to be forced to, you know, resort to because the Mexican economy was also really degraded mm -hmm. at the same time. 
a lot to think about. Yes, well, no, thank you very much. We have been come. blessed. The students, thank you very much for, for participating Great and making questions. Vivian Price feel comfortable with us. Um, let's go to a film clip as, uh, as we say goodbye to Vivian. Um, whatever film clip you guys got available, and then we'll come back, and then I'll take, I'll take uh, everybody's questions and, and phone calls. But Thanks thank so you much. very much for uh, It's a privilege. For coming. Thank yes. you oh, so much. I'm honored.